Yeah, we'd obviously rather be talking about the Sacramento Kings in the play-in or playoffs right now, and I'm jealous of the other locked-on hosts who have the privilege of doing that on a yearly basis. But still, this offseason has a lot to be excited about, a lot to be afraid of, a lot to be interested in. There's a ton to unpack with what the Sacramento Kings are trying to do and what is the most important. Is it the coaching search? Is it surrounding De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis with the right talent to plug this team's holes? Is it improving your starting lineup overall and getting five definitive NBA starters? Is it what you do with your draft pick and this overall 2022 NBA draft? To help answer these questions, weigh these options, and discuss this season as a whole, I'm going to be joined by ABC 10's Sean Cunningham on today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. This season concludes eight seasons now that I've been covering Sacramento Kings basketball. I've been a fan for significantly longer of that growing up here in Sacramento, and I currently work for ABC 10 News, where I am a colleague and longtime friend of my guest on today's Locked on Kings podcast. For those of you who have watched or listened to Locked on Kings for a while, he'll be very familiar to you. For those who follow Kings basketball, he needs to be familiar to uh, to you. Sean Cunningham has been covering the Kings since they last made the playoffs. Sean, back with me here on Locked on Kings to talk about how this season went, but mostly focus on the significance of this upcoming offseason. And Sean is a really good balance for me. I am kind of up there, emotional, crazy at times. I love it. Uh, Hopefully you do as well. Sean kind of balances that out a little bit and brings a seasoned, very familiar with the pain and suffering and struggles of the Sacramento Kings approach uh, to these conversations, which was why I always love having him on the yin to my yang in so many ways. So to be able to have him back on Locked on Kings is a real treat. And we're going to discuss a ton when it comes to this offseason. And what I want to know from you listening to this is what element of this offseason is the most important to where the Kings absolutely 100% have to get it right. Like there are probably multiple areas that the Kings have to get it right if they want to accomplish their goal of being a playoff team next year. But what is the one area, the coaching search, the draft, uh, the uh, trades, free agency, what is the one area this offseason that the Sacramento Kings have to get right in order to be a playoff team? Sean and I will discuss all the different areas. Want to hear you your response to that? You can reach me on Twitter at Matt George Sack. Email me Matt George Sports at gmail.com. Get loose in the comment section down below and ultimately enjoy my conversation with my colleague and friend, ABC 10's Sean Cunningham. Mid-April, and here we are in the offseason, just where we expected to be, and we've been for 16 years. And Sean Cunningham, very familiar with uh with working and focusing on offseason and draft stuff in April while the rest of the league is enjoying uh both play in and play off coverage. Sean, welcome back to Locked on Kings. We we were expecting at least to be covering some sort of playing game at this point in time, but here we are again, 16 years of this. Uh, and uh, as as I will continue to say, it is your fault for when you started covering the Sacramento Kings and the, when the playoff streak began or playoff less streak began. So congratulations, you get your way again, buddy. I don't want the flowers for that. I mean, it is it is true. You know, you start at the Western Conference Finals and it's all been downhill from that. But yeah, Matt. Uh, and it's kind of funny to watch these these playing games. I know we've had basically two days of it and so far so good. It, it, it I know everyone's kind of talking about it, that the Timberwolves and that Minnesota crowd gives people a taste of what Sacramento might look like if they were to win a play in game or came just even stepping onto the floor of a play in game. I mean, that's how starved people are for any modicum of success here in Sacramento. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you feel about the playing game in general. I've been asked a lot about it over the past few weeks and my, my quick rundown of it is I actually like it. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, I, I bring it in. Cause if you, especially this year, if you look, especially in the West and if not for the play in tournament, we would have been playing about a month 
and a few weeks of just meaningless basketball Mm -hmm. where stars and we saw it already where stars are just sitting out lots of rest and people going to games their ticket prices aren't changing much um Mm -hmm. so you know i think at some point the nba has to protect the consumer and i think adam adam silver uh mentioned it the the nba commissioner just the other day talking about there's got to be something done to prevent a lot of these resting players and maybe it's got to be the right you know the right way and uh you get to injuries where you know oftentimes people make up injuries or protect and it's just it's just there's no real clear answer for it but i think by and large i think this keeps the markets that are out of it still interested and i think it protects the teams that that value the regular season Mm -hmm. and win the regular season if you're an upper echelon team in either conference like things look good things you know you're protected i would say i you know my only change that i would make to the play-in tournament seven has to play ten eight has to play nine i don't like this seven versus eight and nine versus ten that's just garbage so have the play-in tournament look like what your tournament looks like and again I'm not for a mid-season tournament, so if this is the, if this prevents that from happening, I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the play-in, I, and and last season's play-in, especially in the West, was a tremendous success. Just with the playing games that we got last season, so I, I don't expect it to go anywhere. Although I do admit, Sean, and I talked about this a lot this year, the play-in in some ways is kind of putting lipstick on the pig in the sense that if the Kings were to have made the play-in in the 10th spot, the likelihood of them winning two games in a row to actually make the playoffs, they're pretty low. You get at least one meaningful game that you ultimately haven't had for for almost two decades now. So that's important. I'm not taking that away. But also, if you don't make the playoffs, once again, you're in a position where you're kind of still in purgatory. You're not bad enough to get the best odds of the top draft pick, and you weren't, again, good enough to make it to the playoffs. But I agree with you completely. The play-in makes at least, um, I mean, less this season to me and more last season with the run that the Kings tried to put together that they had no business putting together when like Terrence Davis was leading the charge. You remember? And, and, uh, and uh, DeLon Wright was leading the charge uh, for the Kings and they actually had a legitimate chance last season. So I'm a huge fan uh, of the plan and we've seen already success stories from the plan that have moved on to bigger and better things like the Memphis Grizzlies are the perfect example of that. A play-in team that actually made it to the playoffs, put up a great fight against the Utah Jazz. Now they're the second best team uh, in the Western Conference. Like that's significant as well. So I think the play-in is an absolute success. Uh, well, I would, And that's well said. I mean, just to stop you real quick, I'm sorry, but like you think about, there's people who already think seven, eight teams deep into a, into a conference is too many playoffs or right? too many for the playoffs. Right. Well, the likelihood of the eighth seed upending the the top seed is is very low. But if you add the play in tournament, it makes it even harder. Mm-hmm. And you think about it, Matt. Like Kings fans, I know they were looking for the play in tournament. But I need to remind people, it's not like it would have snapped the postseason drought. My, if you remember, we talked about it even before the season. I said my the 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 real awful scenario is to finish with the seventh best record in the West, have to play in the play in tournament, get bounced, mm-hmm. and then the streak continues. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you had finished seventh before the playing tournament or even eighth, you're in the, you're in the playoffs and the streak is over. Right. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's a position that we were hoping the Sacramento Kings would be in. Ultimately, Sean, they won just 30 games and they barely won 30 games. And that's less than they won the last two abbreviated seasons. And both of the last two seasons, they won 31 games. Is it, extreme and and you always call me out on this and I love you for is it over emotional to say that this was a wasted season or do you think there's some validity to that statement in what way wasted season in the sense that like let's talk about you had you 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 had Monty McNair claim that Luke Walton he believed in Luke Walton Luke Walton was his guy he comes into the season 20 games in Walton is fired that throws a wrench into things You did pull off the trade at the trade deadline, which I'd say that is the most useful part of this season, especially when you look forward to next year. But I look at it in the scope of like De'Aaron Fox's career. It's he's not necessarily in his prime yet. This is the first year of his max contract. And while he didn't necessarily play well enough to fully complain himself, it just felt like things that were addressed this season could have been addressed last off season that maybe would have had a result to where the Kings were in the plan at this point in time. Yeah, I don't know if I'd call that a wasted season, though. I, okay. I would agree with you. Like, um, Luke should have probably been fired last year. Uh, he didn't have the longest of rope uh, to to be able to work with to come into this season. He fired him at the end of November. Like, you know, if you knew at the end of November, like, why didn't you just fire him in June? So 
I get that. And we talked about that. Um, and, and for anyone who thinks that, oh, we're finally going to see Amani McNair go after the coach he wanted. It, no, don't give him a pass on bringing back Luke Walton. Mm. He, he hitched his wagon to Luke Walton, albeit just a few months. Like he doesn't get a pass there. He doesn't get the, we finally get to see who Monty McNair's coach is going to be. F that. No, that's, that's absolute garbage. This, he did that already. So mm. he doesn't get a pass. Um, and he's not alone. We all know it's a think tank over there. You know, there's a lot of people involved. Uh, and, and there could have been reasons outside of total basketball, uh, and, which I completely understand. I know fans don't want to hear that, but you're talking about a franchise that lost hundreds of millions of dollars mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. of a pandemic. So, you know, the, the, the likely, you know, the, the likelihood of, Oh, well, let's just see what this looks like. Let's double down on what we, what we offered again, what, what we, what we had in the second half of that last season and, and bring it into this season. I can understand that. And I'm, I'm for that. If that's a decision you make, but well, you don't get a pass. And I will say this, like, to say call it a wasted season, no, because if you're the Lakers, that's a wasted season. You've got mm. LeBron James, and you wasted a, a, a year of his career uh, for. And, and granted, he's probably just as fault as, at fault as Rob Polinka and Frank Vogel and all them. But that, to me, if you're a Laker fan, that's a completely wasted season. You did not make the playoffs with LeBron James. With respect to Kings fans, not making the playoffs with De'Aaron Fox and and Demonis Sabonis, who you know you had for not even half a season. That's not a wasted season. No. Understood. You said Monty doesn't get a pass, and I agree with you for um, for h- hitching his wagon to Luke Walton. What about getting a pass for the roster that he brought into the season versus the roster that he's taking out? Because I've said before, and I believe this, it, it feels like Monty is finally putting together his roster, and he still had a whole lot of players from that that Vlade Divac's core and Vlade Divac's era, that many of which are gone, Marvin Bagley and, and Buddy Heald being the main two. You can even talk about Bogdan Bogdanovich that he moved on from uh, right at the beginning of his tenure. Does he get a pass for that in the sense that now he's building his team with this DeMontis Savonis trade and he has uh, Davion Mitchell, who he drafted here? Or is it the same philosophy of, you had multiple off seasons to get rid of these guys and you waited till the middle of the season. Granted, I think he got great value for him, but once again, we could look at that as wasted time too, of what if you had not that Sabonis was available at the beginning of the year. We have no idea what the value was there, but what if you had this version of your roster or close to it for a full 82 games instead of 25, 30 after the deadline? No, there's no pass given, but it, it, the minute he takes over is when you put him on the clock. Mm. It takes time, and I think you know some of the things that I've credited McNair for in the past is sometimes it's the moves you don't make that speak that are, that are more valuable to the ones that you do make. And I think him taking his time uh, to finally land, and we talked about it. Like he he was make a spa, make a splash when the time is right. Make the you know and for the longest time they were chasing Ben Simmons, and then all of a sudden Demonis Sabonis becomes available and. These are kind of how things happen. And, you know, he did bring in movable pieces in last offseason. He made trade and he uh, trades at the deadline the year before, bringing in the guy likes of, you know, Mo Harkless, Terrence Davis, DeLon Wright, some of the things that they've moved on from and some of the ones that they doubled down on as well. So that all plays into it. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a big, entree at the end of the day you have you have chef in the kitchen who's cooking and he's got all these ingredients these are all ingredients your main course is demonis sabonis and yeah you just you just landed that big guy uh just weeks ago um and if we i think we did talk right after that trade Mm -hmm. and you heard me say the season be damned like you've just made a franchise altering move landing a two-time all-star at 25 years old and you're swinging for the fences you know, and you and and I credit them because it was the move you had to make. And as I also said, J, uh, I was called you James. Sorry, as I also called you Matt. Like I told you, Matt. Like the fact is, you parted ways with six players, and really, there's only one of them that you truly valued, and that was Tyrese Halliburton, who slipped to you at twelve. So, mm-hmm. I give Monty a lot of credit for some of the moves that he's done. Uh, you know, certainly not. You can't be perfect. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, but is there a disappointment that they didn't make the playing tournament? No. Because what I would tell people, even though a lot of the national folks would say, oh, you're you're doing all this just to make the play-in tournament. It's like, no, you fools. They still have all their picks. Like, they, they're they going to try to make – they don't have the time to sit there and rebuild. We've seen all that. You've just, you've just given De'Aaron Fox a max contract. And granted, he's young. But it's a move you had to make. So mm-hmm. now put something along with him, you know. 
you didn't move any of your of your uh, your picks at the time. Maybe that happens this offseason. Maybe that happens before the draft. Maybe it happens during the draft. Whether it happens or not, like this is the this is the swing now move, and you're trying to build around Fox. Um, you know, I, I think there was probably a likelihood that they wanted to trade Fox and certainly thought about it. But the reality is, with the amount of money that he makes, no, I, don't, I can't imagine anybody really wanting to break the bank for him. Uh, that's why Tyrese Halliburton was more attractive. He didn't make that much money, and the players were very similar in a lot of ways. Now, granted, one's more of a scorer, one's more of a playmaker. You can argue with the, who's got the brighter future. That's fine. Set that aside. The the guy who had the best value was Tyrese Halliburton because he's under team control. Mm-hmm. Matt, I was shocked that they could get him, get Demonis Sabonis for somebody like Tyrese Halliburton, mm-hmm. and use just a bunch of filler. Like we knew that that other teams would value the talents of Buddy Heal more so than what Sacramento could because they would utilize him in different ways. I didn't think that team would be Atlanta, uh, be Indiana. I thought that team would be someone like Philadelphia. Um, but since both players have been in Indiana both have played pretty damn well. It just hasn't turned and translated into wins and losses for the Pacers either. So uh, it, it's part of a big entree. It's part of a big salad and it's just an ingredient. Uh, and you've got Sabonis. And I said, again, playoffs be damned. Play in tournament be damned. This is a franchise altering move designed for this off season going forward to build around with Fox and see what you can do next year. Not that they're going to be a championship quality team, but they're going to try to use the model that Chicago did when they landed Nikola Vucevic. And, I can't fault them much for that. Today's episode of Locked on Kings is brought to you by Shady Rays, an independent sunglasses company that gives you the best features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed durable frames, and premium high-end finishes, and also something you won't find anywhere else. Shady Rays, they have an insane protection program. Shady Rays includes lost and broken protection on every single pair they sell. They will send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happened. Give them a try, and if you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's as simple as that. Plus, 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays. Exclusively for Locked On Kings listeners, head to ShadyRays.com. Use promo code Locked On to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code Locked On for their best deal of the season 50 percent off two or more pairs of shady rays sunglasses backed by over 150,000 veristar verified five-star reviews you and i were both in the golden one center over the last couple of days for uh De'Aaron fox demonte savonis and monty mcnair's press conferences did anything from those pressers specifically jump out to you or did you take away anything from those pressers that made you feel any different or something that dawned on you, maybe you hadn't thought about before, just anything significant from that that you thought was was is worthy of mentioning beyond just kind of a, a throwaway end of the season comment like we've been privy to far too much over the last 16 years. No, and I, I would say I don't think we learned a lot with the Monty McNair press conference. Um, I think if there's one thing to take away, and it's something I think we already knew, but if I'm a fan, um, I probably like to, to – I like this – the symbiotic relationship that that fox and sabonis both have Mm -hmm. and how well both of them played Mm -hmm. uh even when they didn't uh, even you know (laughs) even when they ultimately suffered injuries but uh the fact that they both look so so great together uh is super encouraging and now you build around it you know with respect to a lot of the players that they have right now i mean that team is just dreck it still is like if you you know i think the competitive spirit was there after the trade i think i think Alvin Gentry has a, uh, you know, a big role in that, but especially once they made the trade, you were bringing in some, some guys that uh, had to give a damn about them. And they, and they, it, it restarted this team and it kind of gave a charge into deer and Fox. And I think even hearing him and Sabonis both talk about Fox having the, the ball in his hands, it, which is something that I've always alluded to because him standing in the corner is, is just, why do that? That's just a waste. So, um, no, I, 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 that's to me, the biggest thing to take away is that both of these guys are motivated. Both of these guys realize that they play well together. Um, they seem to be a good fit. Now you have to add that shooting around them. Mm-hmm. Now you have to add that, uh, <laughs> you have to have those pieces and that can be, that can be really tough to do. Um, you know, they have so many holes, uh, maybe with the exception, you know, and I've always, we talked about this too, uh, Matt, like, I think there's a difference between what's considered depth and quality depth. Mm. And I, and I like to 
kind of harp on that more because I talk about that so much. I think there's a lot of people that just look at the position and see the names and, oh, I know that name, Alex Len. He used to be a king. I mean, with respect to him, he was trash. I mean, he was coming off a terrible year last year. So, like, he there's no way Damian Jones should have become the player that he did this season. And he did so because he had guys that played terribly. I mean, Rashawn Holmes wasn't good this year. Uh, Alex Len was, was not good uh, again. And, you know, a lot of fans thought that that was going to be a big move. You know, wh- again, I still don't understand the, why we're, they're trading DeLon Wright and bringing in Tristan Thompson and then signing Alex Len. Like, how many centers do you need? And I think, again, going back to the Monty McNair thing is this is he was they were trying to set up their team with movable pieces. And it, we all saw that that trade fall through where you were used for leverage with the with the Lakers and the Buddy Heald move that didn't happen. Hmm. And I think, honestly, it's it's a blessing in disguise that it didn't happen. Because you ended up with Sabonis, which is I'd rather have him over Kyle Kuzma and Montrez Harrell. Mm-hmm. Um, that didn't really work out. Montrez Harrell got moved to Charlotte, so um, Kuzma is going to be, I think, a free agent right this year. So if you want him, you can try and go sign him. Uh, I think he's unrestricted, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. So and 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 you need a three and D right now. So that might not be the worst move out there. I was encouraged by McNair's use of the 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 term comprehensive search. I was, I was encouraged by, I guess that's something that I personally needed to hear after what happened with the hiring of Luke Walton and and guys like um, Monty Williams going to the the Phoenix Suns and everything that happened with that. That's just an example off the top of my head, but I was encouraged. By the way, Monty, Monty Williams in Sacramento doesn't guarantee he's Monty Williams. hundred percent, hundred percent. I agree with, I agree with you. Absolutely. But we might be in a reversal here. We were like, man, we could add Luke Walton in Sacramento as opposed to him being in Phoenix. Absolutely. Regardless, I, I like the fact that McNair is going to take his time in looking for this coach. We know he's a patient man based off of what we've seen. I hope he doesn't take too long. Uh, but I, and I also like the fact that he said, and this, this shouldn't be groundbreaking to anybody, but I think it needed to be said. He answered a question saying like, I want our candidates to come in with their own visions and tell me what they would do with our roster, what they would do with our team. And then we'll work together to see if that's what we want to pursue and go forward with versus McNair going out and saying, okay, I need defense and I need someone who's going to play with pace give me the options that fit that to a T type thing. Um, I know that's not necessarily how a coaching search works. So maybe it's not that he said anything groundbreaking. It's more that he reaffirmed things that I've, I'm hoping to see from this coaching search this off season. So that's my main takeaway from at least McNair's press conference. You know what comprehensive means, don't you? I do. The playoffs are still going on, Matthew. There could be coaches that become available once the, their seasons are done. That's not um, that's not stopping the Lakers from going after him right now, apparently. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's also, you know, hey, we want to talk to Nick Nurse. We want to talk to Quinn Snyder. Quinn Snyder may not even be available. Mm. Um, but that that's how you do things, right? So it's uh, comprehensive means that, hey, the draft is in June. We don't really need our coach to be involved with the draft. Mm. I know that in a perfect world scenario, You'd, you'd like some of your coaches to be involved. Um, you have assistant coaches that are still essentially under contract until like June. Um, so like you have people who are able to facilitate um, pre-draft workouts coming in, you know, f- helping you to figure out what you want to do, working out with some of these individuals all the while still being able to be within reach of your players who come in to work out on their own as well. Um but you have a long, 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 long time. We're, we're, we're recording this right now, April 13th. So we've got a long time before that happens. I think in a perfect world, he wants somebody in place before the draft. I don't think that's too out of the question. Um, I think there could be some people that they have their eyes on that they'd like to talk to that are currently involved with playoff series. And more than half the league is currently doing that. So uh, comprehensive to me just means there's no timetable. We're going to take our they're, – they're going to take their time and uh, look up under every rock possible. But also know that if if it does happen next week, that they will have thought that they had a comprehensive <laughs> uh, coaching search. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I'm not expecting it anything quickly. I'm expecting mm-hmm. something that'll definitely go into May. What do you make of what Davion Mitchell did in the uh, towards the end of 
this season. I mean, you can look at the numbers that he put up and not taking anything away from a 15 assist performance, a 17 assist performance, brought that scoring up, was averaging close to 20 points per game over like a, a 11, 12, 13 game stretch. Also was playing almost 41 minutes a night and was taking over 20 shots or close to 20 shots a game. So he had the high volume and the opportunity to do that. Again, I'm not trying to use that to shortchange anything that he did at all. What do you take away from what Davion showed at the end of the season? And I have a follow-up to that specifically about Fox and Davion going forward. Yeah, no, I think it's a big shining beacon. And he was doing it with guys that are lesser talent on the floor, uh, doing it without Fox and, and Sabonis for the most part. The thing that was encouraging to me is that he could step into the role of being the scorer, one that you could sort of rely on, but mm -hmm. also realize that his first priority is defense out there. Um, I mean, that everyone calls him a bulldog, and he's showing it on both ends of the floor. Sometimes they have to set, rescue him from himself because he, he's such a competitor. And um, Alvin was going to use every opportunity to keep him playing, uh, even if it was upwards of 40-plus minutes. So uh, I loved it. Um, I, I thought that's exactly, if you're a Kings fan, what you should be thrilled about going into this offseason. Um, I still, you know, he still gets a little bit lost in the pick and roll. Um, and he's a smaller, smaller guy. So guys can just shoot over him, but it's fun. He's, he's just so fun to watch and you're, you're seeing him become a leader. You're seeing him being a lot more vocal, even on the bench. Um, even sometimes at the expense of his coaches. Uh, but I think, uh, I think he's a winner. I think he's somebody that's, that's not going to accept losing. And you really hope that that doesn't change because sometimes there comes a, um, what's the word I'm trying to search for? There's kind of a, you just kind of get used to your surroundings mm. a little bit, you know, and, and he goes out there looking to compete every single, every single game and not only compete, but win. And mm. I just, I think he had a, um, his signature moment was against Donovan Mitchell, uh, that, that takeaway. Yep. I think he, he had several more. I think that dunk the other night was just incredible, mm -hmm. but I, I was very encouraged. There's not much that, that I could pick on aside from the fact that he probably gets lost in the pick and roll and uh, getting with a real true defensive mind will help him if at all, if that happens or not um, just things that he has to work on. I'd like to see that shot improve a little bit, but certainly he's got a little bit of a clutch gene in him. Um, he doesn't kind of pucker up when, uh, when it gets down to that nut cut in time. So I, I, I like that he has a, is a rise to the occasion type of player. De'Aaron Fox had two of the biggest quotes of the year, both of them lumping praise at uh, or on Davion Mitchell. The first was at the very beginning of the year, him saying he thought that he was already a top, one of the best on-ball defenders in the NBA already. That was before he actually played a meaningful NBA game. And then Fox said in his press conference here at the end of the season, and this might have been the biggest praise you could possibly give anybody with a high work ethic, he said, outside of Kobe, we haven't seen anybody work as hard or, or, or he hasn't seen anybody work as hard as Davion Mitchell does and, and have that reputation. The pairing of them going forward, um, I, I spent a lot of time talking about this. I don't know if it's fair or not. I am I'm hesitant to have confidence at this point in De'Aaron Fox and Davion Mitchell being successful together as a starting unit in an NBA and on an NBA team that has playoff expectations. And a lot of it doesn't have to do with Davion per se. A lot of it has to do with what we saw between Fox and Tyrese Halliburton. People have taken exception and you might as well to me saying that Fox and Halliburton didn't work. And I'm not saying that I don't believe it could have worked and they only got a limited window, 60 or so games or whatever, uh, together as starters to, to to figure it out and to make it work. But all I have is what we saw, and I can't say it by any means that what we saw this season between the two of them was a success or was working. Um, so I, I have the same questions about whether or not Fox and Mitchell can work together, even though Mitchell and Halliburton are, are very different uh, players in a lot of ways. But I'm curious your thoughts on the possibility of Fox and Mitchell starting together, if you think that's something that can be long-term successful for Sacramento, or if he's more cut, you think, for a uh, a six-man Bobby Jackson-esque role off the bench. Like, I'm curious what you think of that. I, I Honestly, I don't think it matters. Um, I know co coaches say it all the time, but it's it really is true. I, I, I'll, I'll go back to Tyrese and Fox for a minute. Mm -hmm. You have you have Mitchell in his first year, kind of a – kind of a half playmaker. I don't think he was a full on playmaker. I still don't. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he's had some brilliant assist nights recently to close out the season. Um, so that was definitely encouraging. I think he can be, but being a rookie so early on with the struggles that they had early in the season, just didn't think he was there yet. 
this team had a void of playmaking and your two best playmakers were in the starting rotation together with, with Ty and, and Fox. So again, I always say Fox without the ball in his hands is, is a waste. Mm. Tyrese is elite. He's an elite ball handler, distributor, all that. Like he just has that vision, sees a play before it happens, racks up the hockey assists like no other, um, especially on a bad team that has no playmaking. So that's why when there were so many people who were like, Oh, Buddy Heald has to come off the bench, has to come off the bench. I'm like, okay, but you kind of want Buddy with a playmaker. <laughs> you need to have you need to get to the ball to, to Buddy Heald to have a playmaker by him. And if you're starting Fox and Halliburton, then one of them has to stay on the floor at all times, and that's tough. Um, so that's why I was always kind of like, if you bring Ty off the bench, it ultimately won't matter. Probably help your team. But I get it. There are there are certain things that kind of fall in line there. Uh, I think they were trying to make it work, much like rewind to having Marvin Bagley and Rashawn Holmes on this on the floor at the same time, like you wanted to have a very strong sample size. I was comparing the situation, not the players, but the situation of Fox with Halliburton being akin to Tyreek Evans and Kevin Martin. Mm. Now, Kevin Martin was not a playmaker by any means, but for whatever reason, when they were on the floor at the same time, it, it was a little bit wonky in, mm -hmm. in, the, in that early going. And then ultimately they moved Kmart. But um I understood it. Like I, I get it. And I think they realized that Fox not having the ball in his hands is, is tough. Tyrese on the flip side of that really can't be with the ball in his, without the ball in his hands either. Um, so how do you go about that? I feel more confident about Davion being on the floor and not having to be the, the ultimate distributor. I think Fox can eventually get there, but he hadn't been in that position ever in his career and it didn't look right. It, it just didn't. And I think he got in, I think he got affected with playing poorly and not being and being in a little bit of a, a unique situation. And granted we saw Ty was the rookie the previous year, but this year was a little bit different. I think Fox played better last year because Halliburton was coming off the bench. Um, I think there was moments to where they shined together others where they didn't. Um, but I also feel like a lot of that had a, a factor in now in talking about Davion, I'm not so much worried about it. I think if I was depending on what the team looks like, uh, I'm probably starting um, in the beginning of the year. If the team if the team is as is, for example, go, and that hopefully that's not the case because the team's direct. But if it starts <laughs> off next year, like I know there's a lot of people that want to see Dante Divincenzo yes. uh, start. I don't I don't see that being terrible. But if the three of them are starting, that's probably not good. You're going to be mm -hmm. really undersized. Um, you know, if if it makes more sense, great. I don't have any problem with Davion Mitchell. Um, being that Bobby Jackson, that six man type of role, I really don't, even if he ends up playing more uh, and you just kind of ride, ride the hot hand uh, mm -hmm. at times. So um, I think it's a good problem to have. I think they can figure it out, but I think ultimately I'll say this, and it's probably a segue to maybe what's to come later in the conversation, but I would say if Dante DiVincenzo is your starting two guard, you're probably not a good team. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't hate Dante. I think Dante's a nice player. I think I think any team any team could be lucky to have a guy what he brings, but I think you probably can and should do better. You know, I'd like to be wrong there. It's just a feeling I get that I don't I don't feel. And if he is your starting two guard, you better have a hell of a three and D. Um, and, and I'm talking bigger, somebody that's even better than someone like Harrison Barnes. You know, who's probably more of a stretch four. Yeah, and I think that's the key right there. Is uh, as of right now, you have three solidified starters on this roster. You have Fox, you have Sabonis, and you have Harrison Barnes. And there's questions as to whether or not the Kings are going to look to trade Harrison Barnes this offseason if they can get value for him, um, which we could talk about that because I don't know if that's the best plan. But regardless, like uh, the, what I've been saying is if, if as of right now, Dante DiVincenzo is my favorite to take that starting two spot and play next to De'Aaron Fox. I think his catch and shoot numbers suggest that he would have benefited from playing a lot more with Fox and Sabonis than the majority of minutes that he got next to Davion Mitchell, where they got some good defensive moments together. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I think Dante could fit well with Fox and Sabonis running in that offense, being able to space the floor a little bit more and be more of effective, uh, more of an effective shooter than he showed here this, uh, this season. That being said, like uh, this all is dependent upon what Monty McNair does this off season. And to me, one of the things that uh, the, one of the boxes that absolutely needs to be checked come October and come the start of next season is you need to have five definitive starters on this team. Even if Davion Mitchell or Dante DiVincenzo are one of them, you, you need to have the, um, the, the confidence in that. And like you said, in order for one of those two guys to be that guy, you have to 
significantly improve either that three or four spot, depending upon what you do with Harrison Barnes. So this is all up in the air. But to me, solidifying the starting lineup and then surrounding that with proven NBA rotational players, that is at the top of my list with the exception of obviously finding a head coach. That is what Monty McNair needs to do this offseason. And saying it is a million times more simple than doing it, not just because of how the Kings struggle to attract free agent talent, but also because the guys that they're looking for, three and D type players, like you mentioned, those are coveted around the league. So you're going to be competing with 29 other teams to bring those guys. Uh, Monty has his work cut out for him in that sense. Yeah, and he sure does. And if you look at DiVincenzo like by himself too, you know, I think someone might they'll, they'll probably point to the year we started 66 games for the Bucks and I think they won the championship. So, um, like, I get it, but they also had playmakers at every single position. That's so hard. That's such a veteran-laden crew to where he can do so much. And then if he, you know, has the ankle injury, then you get kind of beat out by Grayson Allen at that point. Like, mm. it's it's not good. So he's coming back in a different way. Um, I, I agree with you. I don't know that – certainly for good teams, you know who your starters are. Mm-hmm. I can't say that for probably half the league where you can go, yeah, you're a solidified starter. I think there's a good portion of the league that doesn't have those types of starters where you're like, oh, he's starting on a good team or this person's are starting on every single team. Like it's, it's, it's hard to do that. It's mm-hmm. really hard. So you almost, that's why, especially a small market, free agency, whatever you're doing, you know, I don't know that you'll ever get there. I mean, certainly when the Kings were right, they had starters at every position. Bobby Jackson could have been a starter at one point on many teams. Um, but you you knew who your starters were. I I do always grimace a little bit when you see a coach who t- tends to react to what the other team is doing as opposed to just setting the tone yourself. I agree. I think I think Alvin did a pretty good job with that. You could criticize who he started if you didn't if you know. And there could be some extenuating circumstances in terms of like what the organization wanted to see start. Um, but he at least had his he. He at least, for the most part, had his starting unit, and he didn't fluctuate a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it did, it was literally because of a player wasn't available, injury, what have you. And I think he managed that well. He's a little bit old school in that way. Uh, but I, I'm not a guy who likes to see starting units fluctuate from game to game. And you look at the other team and you go, well, they've got this. We have to do this. It's like, no, just play your game. Absolutely. Do what you do, stick to your system. Because if you end up doing that, then what you're saying is your system's not good enough. <laughs> so um, if you go out and you get a coach like Matt, Mike D'Antoni, who's going to run the hell out of the ball and defense isn't going to be at a premium, um, you think he's ch- changing up his starting rotation very often? No. Mm. So it's going to be something to, to monitor. Uh, it, I think it depends on who your coach is and see if that coach is in line with the philosophy of what the front office wants to see. Because um, like it or not, the front office is, is already and will going forward have a huge uh, impact on on the rotations of this team. And and starting your starting a unit that is not going to fluctuate depending upon what your opponents do and playing their game. I think that's an excellent point by you because I was going through the numbers, the end of the season numbers and where the Kings ranked in a lot of areas. And it was no surprise, even though offensively we expected this team to be much better than they were. It was no surprise to see them in the bottom half of the league in almost every statistical category. But one thing jumped out to me that frustrated me, and that was seeing the Kings in the bottom half of the league in transition offense and, and mm. uh, fast break points points and they also gave up more fast break points than they scored that can't that doesn't make any sense to me when you have a guy named De'Aaron Fox on your roster granted he missed some time with injuries and you were trying to get him and Halliburton playing together I could list uh, so many excuses it it just to me that's not playing to your strengths even remotely at all Uh, and that's on Walton that could be on Gentry that could be on the players regardless like that's something that this this team needs to correct or I, I want to see the team play to their definitive strengths. Maybe they still have to establish those definitive strengths this offseason, Sean. But once those are established, play to them next year. Don't change what you're doing depending upon if Giannis and Tintacumpo is coming in or LeBron James is coming in or a roster of young players that you think you could bully. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Fox there because this was the year where you saw fans kind of turn on him a bit. The, the, mm-hmm. the shine was off the diamond a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think obviously with the bigger money comes bigger responsibility. So part of the reason he's so in love with having Demonis Sabonis is there is that it takes, gives him help for one. It takes pressure off him for two. Now he can, he, you know, I think he's going to be the first guy to, to tell you that he's not that type of leader that most people want. Mm. Um, that's not why he gets paid the big bucks to do that. So um, someone that stays on Fox will be a good thing. I mean, the guy's got to keep his foot on the pedal, um, but Sacramento has a weird, 
love hate relationship with the best player on the team. It's always kind of fun to, to, it's a, it's an interesting like science experiment. And, and when you look at the players that are beloved and the ones that aren't, Mm -hmm. and um, the, 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 the keep the, the, the main player is always the one that ends up getting into the, into the firing squad a little bit. And he's the guy that checked every box for what fans wanted, you know, wanting to be here, uh, a, a huge national name, um, saying all the right things, always alluding to the fan base, going out there and hustling and playing hard for, for the most part, but also just a quirky, great personality, sarcastic, you know, um, great sense of humor. And, and, you know, again, he, De'Aaron Fox isn't doing anything he's that he hasn't done before. Uh, I just think what's happening with the fan base is they're looking at him and they were thinking he'd be a star. Mm-hmm. And I think now they're starting to look at him and go, uh, mm. maybe not. Maybe not, but it doesn't mean you can't still be a great player. It doesn't mean you can't still go out and, and prov- uh, provide wins for this team, which at the end of the day, that's that's all what it's all about. So that's why I feel like the Sabonis pairing is is, is interesting for him, and we'll have to see what they build around it. So, um, yeah, I I, I I I think it's just an interesting study on, on what he can be. I feel like think of it this way too, Matt, like it's, it's oddly similar to the DeMarcus Cousins situation. DeMarcus Cousins is an all-star in the West on your, on your, on your team and you've given him a big deal. And then when the new GM comes in, Vladi Divac, four of his first five, three of his first four were six eleven or taller draft picks. Mm. Right. So you're De'Aaron Fox and here you just get this money. And now you got two guys that are playing your position drafted in the NBA. Mm drafted to your team. So you might be in your feelings a little bit. You might be, you shouldn't be, and you can criticize, Hey, you're, you're paid handsomely, go out and beat them. Like you should beat them. You're the, you're the guy. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I think having one of those guys away, um, realizing that it's probably in the best interest for your, for your team and having a playmaking center. I think this is, I think this is going to bode well for Fox. So, and if it doesn't, well, then you know that this isn't your guy and you're going to probably have to move him anyway. So Mm -hmm. um, they've got, the, the, these are all things that are setting up nicely for the future and you'll have some decisions to make. Locked on Kings brought to you by our friends at Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is so important for your daily nutrition. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. Contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting good. And what I love the most about Athletic Greens, which will help overall uh, improve your health, improve your focus. For me, what it does is it supports better sleep quality and recovery. It supports mental clarity and alertness. It's the one thing with the best things. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iterations and third-party testing. And it's not expensive. You get all these benefits without paying a top dime. It costs you less than $3 a day, and you're investing in your health. It's cheaper than your cold brew habit. It's cheaper than getting all the different supplements for yourself. You're investing in all-in-one nutritional insurance for you. Cheap, easy, delicious, and makes you feel so much better. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NBA network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NBA network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And today's Locked on Kings podcast brought to you by Built Bars. In addition to the great stuff that you get from Athletic Greens, why not eat healthy, replace the candy bars that you love so much with a candy bar that's also a protein bar that is way better for you, tastes better, and provides a variety that you will not get bored of. The amount of flavors that Built Bar has covered in 100% chocolate, uh, how good it is for you, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to 240 calories and 30 grams of sugar, dozens of net carbs of the average candy bar. It's really a no brainer. In addition to their bars that they're known for, you can also try their new marshmallow puffs. They're protein infused marshmallows. Yeah, that's a thing. That's real. 
marshmallows that are good for you and loaded with protein. There's so many different flavors, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream for you to try. Go and order your Built Bars or your Marshmallow Puffs today at Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. The thing I like the most from De'Aaron's press conference is he he said without being asked, he said, look, with the exception of like the first game of the season, I he said he admitted he didn't feel that he was playing nearly up to, to his ability. He said until kind of the final 15 or so games that he was playing before he got that hand injury, which turned out to be a hell of a lot more significant than I realized, Sean. Um, but regardless, I appreciate hearing that from De'Aaron because I've been critical of De'Aaron, not nearly as critical as I've seen some people who are ready to take the keys, forcibly remove it from Fox's hand and give them to Tyrese Halliburton and say, take us to the promised land. Um, I, I was never that out on De'Aaron, but I never liked the idea of what I thought some people were using as an excuse. I don't think Fox was using it as an excuse, but I think some people were using, oh, De'Aaron gets off to slow starts as a bit of an excuse to some, and that's something that I personally, especially if the Kings are going to be making the playoffs next year in the West, I expect to get better. Like this year in the West was so bad and you still didn't make the playoffs. Uh, I I expect the West to get better next year, even with Sabonis on this team. And hopefully with a a multitude of upgrades, this off season, you're not really going anywhere. If De'Aaron Fox doesn't get to his best level until you're five, six, seven, eight games under 535 games into the season. Right. I want De'Aaron to be playing at, his star potential. I want him to be either an all-star or an all-star stub next year from day one to game 82, as much as he possibly can. It's it's impossible to do all 82 games, but I want to see it at the beginning. I don't want him to wait to build up to get to that point. And he said, without being asked, he didn't say that directly, but he brought that up and that was refreshing uh, for me to hear. Yeah. And I think, you know, he didn't have that player on the team that would demand it from him. Yes. You know, so often that, that, yeah, I think Sabonis can be a leader. I think he can be, he's a guy that, I mean, it's fun to watch him, especially the first game in Sacramento and he's pay attention. And this means nothing for the most part, but sometimes it means more than you think. Look at how many times he's given people high fives and talking to him. And it's like stuff like that. Like he's putting his hand, like he's, it's, it's Vladi esque. He's putting his hands. He's like, it's affectionate. It's he's, 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 he's the best teammate you could have. He really is. And I think there's some leadership that comes with that. He's a, he's a constant motivator. Now who knows if they have another losing season, what does it look like? I mean, granted, it's not like the Pacers were setting the world on fire. They were a losing team and they were, I don't know if Matt, I don't know if you've done this, but if you go and look at how many games that the, that the Pacers lost last year, so many of them were close much like, I mean, the Kings had a lot too, but they were getting their head kicked in. So often. yes, Yep. Um, there was a lot of tough luck losses for the Pacers last year um, before they had dealt Sabonis. And uh, I remember looking at that, especially right around the time that the report came out that that they were going to, that Sabonis would be available, which to be honest, I didn't believe. And, and I, I told you at the time, I said, you know, I thought the, if you thought the asking price for Simmons would be high, mm. Sabonis, who, who isn't a complete shell, like he's a pretty decent defender. Um, not a great shooter, but he, in my mind, he's a much more skilled basketball player than what Ben Simmons is. Um, uh, you know, I was like, if you think the asking price is high for Simmons for a guy who doesn't want to be there, you know, Sabonis doesn't have to leave. Like the guy's still playing. He's a, everyone, no one's going to say really a bad word about him. And if you're, if you're trying to move that, what do you think the asking? And, and to see what they gave up to get him again, I'm still blown away by that being said, um, yeah, if he gets over here and all of a sudden losing happens, you know, maybe that that comes off, that shine comes off a little bit. But I do feel having somebody like Sabonis pushing Fox, being in his ear, it's one thing to have an all-star doing it. It's another thing to have somebody like Buddy Heald and Harrison Barnes who have never been that type of player. They're competitive for sure. They're good teammates for the most part for sure. Um, but Demonis Sabonis constantly doing that and also representing your team's best players – between him and Fox. And I kind of think it's Demonis at this point because he has been an all-star and he capable of being the more talented player overall. Uh, I think that goes a long way. Sean, final thing for you. I know I'm guilty of this. We've heard a lot of people say this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest off season in, in recent Sacramento Kings history. Can I, can I point something out? I'm not drinking the company Kool-Aid, by the way. I This says right here, somebody's mentioned this one time on a YouTube thing. 
Uh, this bottle is made from up to 60% recycled plastic. Please refill, reuse, and always recycle. So this is the uh, the what you get at the games, and I uh, I do. I do my part. I, I refill and reuse. Sean, for audio listeners, he's drinking water out of a sack of oh, bottle, yes. <laughs> pr- further proving that he is under the team payroll and he only pushes <laughs> the team agenda as expected from one Sean Cunningham over the years. Uh, no, Sean's a great guy, and I, I feel bad for uh, for not using that water bottle more or using a water <laughs> you, bottle more. You just chuck it and move on. Right over the shoulder, baby. I'm 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 the demographic they're trying to reach and they need to reach. Uh, but regardless, the significance of this offseason, Sean, where is it at with you with Sabonis being I mean, he's under contract for two more years. Realistically, you'd like to get this thing knotted up and handled a year from now. So where you don't have to worry about him potentially becoming a, uh, an unrestricted free agent. You have De'Aaron Fox going into year two, all the holes that the Kings need to fill potentially a high draft pick, depending upon how the lottery uh, ends up. Like where does this off season now off season number three for Monty McNair, where does this rank for you in, in recent memory of Sacramento Kings significance? Uh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I, I think we all have the habit of just saying, oh, this is an important off season, you know, like, because they all are right. Especially when you're a bad team. <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't know if one ranks any higher than the other. I mean, maybe not necessarily rankings. I'm, I'm more looking at like, is it overblown to, to talk about the significance of this off season because how much rides on it, or is it another, just another off season to where moves are going to be made. They're going to have repercussions down the road that we're not going to know. And that we are going to realize like, I, that's, that's more what I'm looking at. Not necessarily. How is this one better than 2018 or something? No, I, I, I feel that it's just another off season. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we'll know more when the lottery happens, if they happen to jump up, you know, to a top four pick, certainly that'll make the weight of things a little bit better, but like you already landed the hard day to the, the hardest part. Mm. Like you've, you've got an all-star caliber center, uh, a guy who can, you can move the ball through. Like, again, I'm, I'm starting to sound like the Demonis Savonis PR machine, but um, he represents the, the franchise shift, you know, like it or not. Mm. And if people think like you're going to add somebody that's better than him, I mean, maybe um, I just don't see it, but maybe, um, I, I think he's just going to be the, the head of your head of your snake. Now it's a two headed monster. Mm. And, you know, I mean, you could trade Fox possible. I don't see it, but you could, um, I don't know. I think we'd probably have more answers when the, when the, when the lottery comes around, I think, uh, you know, I'm someone who has been pretty vocal about probably trading the pick or a pick because mm-hmm. it's such a great asset. And before you landed Sabonis, shoot you could still even you could still even say even now that they have Sabonis that maybe that pick before you attach the name to it is still your most attractive piece maybe not even this year but maybe the the next year's pick or whoever Mm -hmm. um you know right now it's looking like seven and kings are used to that they haven't drafted very well at that position but you know it's look it's not so much of if you're looking at the draft, if you're looking at free draft, it's, it's fantastic. Like, yeah, move up, whatever. You got to draft well. We get it. Hopefully, the way this team gets better is through trades and just somebody becoming a star like Fox. Like, if he can become a star, that'll that'll be great, If you know, especially if it's along the side of Demonis. But the way this team gets better is trades. You're not getting anybody free agent-wise. This team is already, I mean, Matt, when you look at it, you're already pretty much at the, you have so much payroll. Mm-hmm. Um you know, like I think there's a the decision to be made on Dante DiVincenzo, and yes, they've traded for him twice, um, so that shows you that they like him. But do you like him at 15 million a year? Hmm. Is a team gonna? There's only probably I think there's I was looking at it the other day. You know, I'm no salary cap whiz, but I think there was only like six teams, five or six teams that could like outright just go out and sign him. I mean, some team probably will give him the mid level exception, right? But he's restricted, so like, you know, reports of Oh, his people or him, they're up in arms because he wasn't starting. Or, I mean, if I'm Monty McNair and Wes Wilcox and the Kings organization, I'm going Crimea River. I, you know, we hold all the cards. If we want you back, you're back. You know, that's why restricted free agency is never, it's not like unrestricted free agency where you get wine and dined and everyone's going to talk nice to you. Restricted free agency is go find yourself the best deal that you can and it may fit what we want. Because at the end of the day, 
we will hold all the cards. We'll either match it and keep you and we'll leave happily ever after. Or we'll say, okay, great. You got that. Go ahead and sign with them. Or we'll say, great. You got that. Let's facilitate a sign and trade. Um, restricted free agency is just an ugly process that always, by the way, works well for the player. They bet on themselves. They go out and find the money, but it is a, uh, it's up for other teams to wine and dine you. The Kings don't, aren't the, they're going to extend the qualifying offer and they're going to go out and, you know, they'll, they'll negotiate. But if you find a deal that's paying you $15 million a year, if I'm the Kings, I'm probably saying good luck with the rest of your career. <laughs> you know, maybe there'll be a third time we trade for you <laughs> down the road, but uh, you know, again, restricted free agency is ugly. And, and you hear all these people, Oh, we're upset. We're upset. We're upset. They're going to do what's first of all, they're it's not, they're going to do the best interest for Dante. Even they're going to do the best. What's in the best interest for the Sacramento Kings. Every company in the country is like that. Mm -hmm. You have an HR department, you have a union union will, will protect you, but your HR department is there to protect the company first and foremost. So um doesn't mean they don't care about you, but they care about the company. So, mm -hmm. You know, the Kings are going to do what's best for them. Well, regardless of uh, what decisions McNair makes or doesn't make this offseason, we're expecting it to be busy. And Sean, this will not be the last time this offseason that we have you on, my friend. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time, as always. I appreciate it. Enjoy your Sacramento Kings slash DeMontis Savonis uh, water bottle that you're you're clearly sipping from over there. And uh, I look forward to your bias takes next time I have you on, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Matt. Really appreciate having Sean on again. Out of everything that we talked about, all the elements of this offseason, what to you is the most important thing to the Sacramento Kings and Monty McNair absolutely has to get right? Let me know on Twitter at Matt George Sack. You can email Sean, or rather tweet Sean Cunningham at Sean Cunningham on Twitter. You can email me Matt George Sports at gmail.com or leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Appreciate your support as always. Can't wait to have you back with me on the next episode. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked On Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.